So welcome, everyone. Um, this is Rona Rothenberg. I'm the, proud to serve as the 2022 president of AIA California. And I'm very uh, grateful to have all of you join our uh, esteemed board of directors, our executive vice president, Nikki Dennis Stevens and her competent staff. Uh, and uh, for this event, which is a collaboration of AIA California and the National Project Delivery Knowledge Community Advisory Group as bringing to you professional colleagues from government, industry, construction, program and project management and higher education for a quick paced, informative and lively two hour moderated panel and discussion about the broad a strategic goal and objective of diversity across a wide range of project delivery methods, career paths, and architects' personal backgrounds and work. Our diverse industry experts will explore from their experience and their careers, what pipelines and graduates in architecture, licensed architects and, and our colleagues uh, can achieve and, and add to at all levels and, and, ma and make a uh, fruitful living in, in a satisfying way. Uh, coming from construction, real estate, and the public sector, they will inform a number of our AIA California strategic goals and objectives and bring to you a, a new ways of thinking about your careers and our shared work. In, in terms of equity, diversity, and inclusion, climate action, practice, membership, construction and delivery, AEC collaboration, and advocacy. Prepare to be impressed. And welcome to our uh, August colleagues just starting here, Laura Stagner, FAIA, DBIA, PMP. Laura is the chair of the National Knowledge Community Advisory Group. And if you don't know about the KCs and the advisory groups, please look at the national webpage and led the federal program for the United States GSA. And Gregory Gede, FAIA, FDBIA, Director of Design for Hensel Phelps, again, a member of our Knowledge Community Advisory Group. Grace Flynn, AIA, CSI, CDT, DBIA, Senior Project Manager for CB, RE Project Management Healthcare in New York, also a member of our Knowledge Community Advisory Group. And Kyle Gray, AIA, DBIA, Lead AP, PMP, Regional Design Manager for Turner Construction, and a member of the Knowledge Community Advisory Group. Michael Rausch, welcome Michael, FAIA, Lead AP, a Program Manager for Business Enterprise for UC San Diego in capital program management. And our colleague, California, Mani Subramanian, AIA, FCMAA, DBIA, CCM, the president of Six Dimension, a program, project, and construction management um, consulting practice. All right, and our, so now our CEUs are of this, of course, we're a con continuing ed provider. And so we've summarized the areas that are, we're, we're covering broadly, both as a consequence of our board's strategic goals and objectives and consistent with our national goals and objectives as, as architects and as an organization, the framework for design excellence, talking to accomplished segment leaders on project of delivery in a range of state-of-the-art methods that can deliver design excellence, careers for diverse architects, ED, EDI across the sectors, uh, uh, all of the sectors across architecture, engineering, construction, and project management. And then leadership, developing leadership in project management, uh, design, and project delivery uh, across the different sectors, uh, both in private practice and in allied careers. And of course, collaboration with general contractors, with our colleagues in higher education, our colleagues in construction management, and in project management on what we might call traditional and non-traditional careers in traditional and non-traditional, which now becoming mainstream forms of project delivery, design build, progressive design build, see them at risk, uh, design assist, lean practice, and of course, design bid build, which uh, is, is now um, a less prevalent and the two learning units that you'll get. So starting off, 
Laura. Laura, welcome. And thank you for um, being here and sharing your background. Okay. Uh, it's great to be here. Thank you for inviting us to this. This is kind of a fun and interesting thing to do. So yes, I am the former Assistant Commissioner for the Office of Project Delivery, U.S. General Services Administration, Public Building Service, retired. That's a mouthful. What it really means is um, I was the senior person in my agency responsible for project delivery, capital program delivery, small projects delivery, reimbursable, customer agencies would give us money. That was, I was the one who was responsible for policy, um, program oversight, measures, training, things like that. We'll get into that. My career briefly, very briefly. I uh, graduated from architecture school in 1981. It was a down economy. And I ended up going to work for the US Army Corps of Engineers in Louisville, Kentucky. And I spent, when they were still doing design, architectural design in-house on the boards, which is that they soon after that stopped doing that. But I actually got real world uh, experience within the Corps of Engineers designing a couple of buildings. I worked for them for two and a half years, um, met my husband, got married. We moved to Ann Arbor uh, because that was, he, he was a major in the Corps of Engineers and that was his next assignment. And I went to graduate school at Michigan and got a graduate degree in architecture and one in construction management, which turned out to be one of, one of the important building blocks of my future career. Um, after I had left the Corps of Engineers, I promised I would never work for the government again. Not going to happen. My, I did my internships while I was in grad school with Newman Gregor in Southfield, Michigan. My husband's next assignment was a NATO assignment in Naples, Italy, and lo and behold, uh, my next job was with the U.S. Navy. I was a planner for a base. Uh, they, they were in a defunct, the Navy base in Naples was in a defunct volcanic crater with only one way in and one way out. And so they had, they were um, petitioning Congress to replace that base. And I was the planner for the replacement. Um, my husband's next assignment was in Philadelphia, and that's where we currently reside. That's where we have both um, lived for 30 years. And my, and my next job was with the uh, shipyard in Philadelphia. I was the head of a maintenance planning function, and we did small projects. I had a, a staff of five people. We did small projects. And then the shipyard was closed, and a friend of mine who worked at GSA uh, said, you know, we're hiring. It was the end of the Reagan administration. The, the Clinton had just been elected. And they said, and we're expecting a freeze, a hiring freeze. So apply right now. And so I did. And I got hired into a planning function at GSA. And I spent the next 25 years of my career at, at GSA working through a, a variety of jobs, planning, portfolio, and asset strategy, um, managing what they called a realty services district, which had engineers, architects, really specialists, contracting officers, just delivering a program of projects for a certain geographic area. I became involved um, with the projects with the Recovery Act in 2009. I was one of the zone executives. I had the area from Maine to Washington, DC, and about $2 billion of the $5 billion worth of Recovery Act projects that GSA got. And that was a very interesting program. We got a lot of money. We had a 15, 18 month deadline to spend the money. And we had a five year, de uh, you know, obligate the money in contracts. And then we had a five year deadline and the money would liquidate. So the projects all had to be done, designed, you know, bid out and done in this five year window, which forced us out of a default mode of design bid build into uh, a more aggressive uh, adoption of design build and uh, construction manager at risk. At the end of that program, um, my former supervisor retired and uh, I applied for and got his job. And I so I ended up as the assistant commissioner for the Office of 
project delivery. So let me, before I get into what we did in that job, I'm gonna give you a little bit of information about GSA. So next slide. Okay, so GSA's mission, uh, we, were, we were formed or GSA was formed in 1949 uh, to consolidate the purchasing functions across non-DOD agencies to improve the cost effectiveness of purchasing, to improve the leveraging uh, and le the improve the leverage of that pur purchasing power. And we consolidated a whole lot of assets from the Department of the Treasury and other parts of the government into one um, consolidated management of those real estate assets. So GSA has a function that's about purchasing acquisition and we have a, there's another function in the public building service that is about managing these assets. Next slide. So the public building service is the one of the manages one of the nation's largest and most diverse real estate portfolios. I refer to the public building service as the government's landlord. We are a tiny little 5,000 person agency that has this, that is, leverages a whole lot of contracts in one form or another to manage this diverse portfolio across 50 states, five territories in the District of Columbia. Of the 2 million federal employees, we house nearly half of them. There are 8,000 assets, about half are owned, about half are leased. Uh, the kinds of assets we have are federal courthouses, land ports of entry, federal office buildings, data centers, and labs. Um, there are a few other cats and dogs, but that's the main categories. Three, 370 million square feet of workspace and 413 buildings listed on the National Register of Historic Places. That picture there, uh, Thurgood Marshall U.S. Courthouse, originally built in 1935 and renovated as part of the Recovery Act. Next slide. So PBS's Office of Project Delivery, or the, the office I was in charge of, has an average annual work in progress, absent things like IJA, absent things like the Inflation Reduction Act, just our average work in progress is about $10 billion of work a year. A um, couple of highlights, we have what we call the Design Excellence Program. You probably have heard of that. Uh, we that program is not just about design design. We do bring industry peers into uh, project development, into the early design cycle, part of the design cycle, to to give feedback to the designer um, regarding any aspect of design. Really, we we bring in landscape peers, we bring in um, engineering peers. But the, the Design Excellence Project has evolved from its beginning to include operational excellence, sustainability, the, you know, the, the idea being that a design excellence is really about designing an asset that is going to be a 50 to 100 year long term hold for the government and thinking about what that means. What does it mean to, to deliver that kind of asset in a cost effective way for the taxpayer. It doesn't mean it, it isn't good design, but it's good design that takes that long-term view into account. We also have the Construction Excellence Program. Uh, we put that into the place in the early aughts. Uh, There's quite a bit of um, literature that says it, as you, at, as projects come together as early as 15% in construction, it can be obvious that the team is or is not going to work well together. And the essence of delivering a good project in construction is that the team gels. They have to be a high performing team. So the Construction Excellence Program also brings industry peers into projects that are in construction, going to the job site, again, as early as 15%, assessing the health of that team, giving feedback to that team about things they could consider. We come back at 50%, assess again. And then at 85%, there is generally a final lessons learned session. Um, so those are two of the building, the, the bigger building blocks of the 
the project delivery program there at GSA. We also do, as I said, project manager certification and training. We have had a 20 year, um, 20 plus at this point, year contract with Harvard uh, to do uh, the Harvard School of Design. And they have done a series of case studies that then get taught. I think there are probably a library of 30 or 40 case studies that get taught in an interactive session three or four times a year um, and can be taught on demand. Finally, we do a lot of program oversight and risk management, delivering a $10 billion pro uh, program is never easy. Um, it is a, uh, even when we put all that effort into making sure we have designed the right asset and we have the right team building the asset and we have picked the right delivery method that is, a, is effective for that asset, there's still an, a component where throughout the life cycle of any project, we keep an eye on it, we, we assess, you know, schedule and budget progress. We help uh, teams bring corrective actions to to their into their mix if they need them. Uh, we have a, a series of subject matter experts at the central office that are essentially national assets that can be deployed to deal with any any particular uh, any project specific particular problem. Next slide. So I talked a little bit about the different uh, building typologies. I wanna just show you a very quick overview of what that kind of looks like in, in, in practice. Uh, these are all buildings that were built or assets that were built using not design bid build. It was you know design build or CM at risk. A lot of the research that I conducted when I came into office um, indicated that design bid build was while an, an appropriate tool in some circumstances was the least effective choice we could make on average. It, it didn't keep us in our design and, or sorry, our schedule and budget contingencies, whereas design build and CM at risk did. So it's never a good thing when you go over, over budget, you have to go back to Congress for money. That is a lengthy process. You can imagine during an active construction project, you don't wanna wait six months to find out if Congress is gonna let you use more money. So be, living within your contingencies is a much, a much better strategy. So some examples, um, the SSA National Support Center in Urbana, Michigan, uh, Maryland, sorry, it's, it's a data center. It was part of the recovery project uh, program, and it won numerous design awards and is lead gold. A good example of a federal office building is the FBI federal office building in uh, Miramar, Florida. Um, Pensa Phelps, Greg is on. He might touch on this as well. And it won numerous awards. It's lead gold. It is it is surprising for the FBI, they're very happy there. Uh, the Robert Jackson US Courthouse in Buffalo, CM at risk, um, Lead Gold won awards in New York and the Sylvia H. Rambo US Courthouse in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. That ribbon cutting is in December of this year. So it's, a, it's still being finished, it's CM at risk delivery method. And it is targeted to be lead platinum. So uh, that's just a quick overview of the kind of work that GSA does. It's a quick overview of the kind of work that PPS does. Um, thank you again, Marona, for inviting me. Thank you, Laura. So going from the federal architect working as a lead, uh, as, the, as a chief, to the federal sector, to an architect leading design and construction in the construction sector with a major construction program. Next uh, slide, Gregory. Okay, hello everybody. Uh, my name is Greg Gidez. I'm a licensed architect and I'm the corporate director of design services for Hensel Phelps, which is one of the larger uh, general contractors nationwide. Um, prior to joining Hensel Phelps, I, I practiced architecture for 26 years at Fentress Architects. And uh, that's where I learned the craft of architecture. Um, so a lot of people tell me I am a, I, I went from the over to the dark side uh, and jumping from the design side to the construction side, but I gotta say it was very enlightening 
and has uh, really been a very important part of my career. Uh, my career started uh, at 10 years old when I designed my first house plans for my mother. And of course, uh, she loved Colonial, so it was a center hall Colonial. Uh, nothing ever happened with it, but uh, I, it, I, that's when I, I got the bug to be an architect. Uh, at 15, I started putting myself to work uh, to make some money, and I was doing construction. I, I did my first design-build project working on a swimming pool uh, for a design-build swimming pool uh, contractor in, in North Jersey. And I learned all kinds of interesting things like uh, how to tie rebar, form work, piping, unions, and all kinds of other crazy things. Um, so that's where I got my start in design and construction. Uh, I, uh, my first design build project uh, commercially was the Colorado Convention Center uh, in, in Denver, uh, where we teamed up, uh, I was with Pinterest Architects, teamed up with Hensel Phelps, and we were doing this thing called, this, well, we didn't even know it was called design build, it was something that we were doing in the mid 80s, and uh, we didn't know what to call it, but that really uh, opened my eyes to how much I did not know about uh, the world of design and construction. I thought I knew it, it pretty well, but uh, working directly with the contractors really opened up my eyes. Um, a great experience. Uh, I also have done a few uh, development projects where I was the design builder developer and uh, hired a project manager and then went to work for him uh, on weekends, uh, banging nails and doing all kinds of stuff to keep myself involved. <clears throat> So that was kind of a great experience also. Uh, but what I learned in, in that mid-career shift that there's a great opportunity for architects and designers in the construction side. Uh, the way we're trained as architects uh, trained us differently on how to approach projects and, uh, and, and that really can enhance the design build uh, delivery method. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and really what we what I'm going to talk about here is sort of the master builder approach to design and construction and the uh, uh, opportunities that it can to present to those in, in architects or the design profession. It's uh, it's really an enlightening way to look at it. Uh, again, it uh, it works much better if you're all on the same team. And we'll talk a little bit more about the team here in a minute. OK, next slide. Uh, it's kind of funny that Laura referenced this project here down in in Florida, the uh, the FBI uh, Mir, uh, Mir, uh, Federal Office Building for the FBI down in Miramar, Florida. Uh, this was a very challenging design build project because it's it was a very high end design with a tight budget and technically challenging in, in the in the assembly of the uh, of the building. And I think. Uh, when Mark uh, Sexton, the, the design architect, got word that it was going design build, I think his hair nearly, nearly uh, fried. He was so afraid that the, uh, the design excellence would be lost. Uh, but uh, the, in the end, working with the, uh, with the designers, with the trades, we were able to really refine the design. And uh, I think it, it really uh, improved or enhanced the, not only the design, but the performance of the building. And at the end of the job, uh, Mark said that the building uh, was actually better than when he when he started when he left the design and the bridging documents. And uh, the next thing he said was, "Can I work on your next design build project?" So that was a good uh, uh, support of of our philosophy. But it takes that educated person in order to work in that environment. You need to understand what's important to the whole team. Uh, so in this case, design excellence was very important to the owner. Uh, working with the, the trade partners and, and refining the curtain wall was very important to the success of the of the design. And the design success uh, helped the vision, uh, GSA uh, meet their vision of that design excellence. This building has won so many awards; it's ridiculous. And uh, it and as, as Laura said, the FBI loves it. So uh, let's go to the next slide. Um, you need that interdisciplinary fluency to work across the design and the construction. Uh, I like to say that, you know, way back when the light bulb went off and somebody said, hey, if we take out the space between the columns, we, we might get a better building here. And uh, 
And so we, we, you know, we've advanced the design and construction, you know, over thousands of years, but it takes uh, uh, an understanding of what goes into that, the business, the design, the technology, the processes, and the personalities that and relationships that come together that bring our buildings together. Uh, next slide. I like to say, uh, think like Filippo. Uh, Filippo Brunelleschi was the uh, the genius behind the dome in Florence. Uh, this building had sat without a dome for over a hundred years, I believe, because nobody could figure out how to do it. And here comes a, a clockmaker that figures out the design, the construction, and and also the machinery that were going to be required to erect the dome. And um, you know that's thinking outside the box and and being a visionary. Uh, and that's what it need you need to uh, cross disciplines. Uh, fast forward 500 years, and I had a project uh, in in California where we were uh, in Italy to discuss the stone and the stone fabrication and the and the fabricator said we can't do the 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 design that you want to do we can't get the joints that you want to do uh it's impossible uh this is uh uh, uh the specialty trade contractor so, so i said okay let's break and let's go over into florence and go toward the dome uh, of the, the, the cathedral in florence and so we went into the building and everybody looks up at the dome and is admiring the beauty of the dome and the construction, except for the stone fabricator who had dropped to his knees and started praying because he saw the work that had been done 500 years ago on the stone flooring and he knew that his case had just been sunk. And we were able to get our design and our joints uh, as a team, but it, it took Filippo to show us how to do it. Uh, but. Uh, Approach it with that that master builder mentality, the, and and look for ways to enhance the the opportunity and to innovate. Okay, next slide. Um, this is something that's important as you advance your career. Um, we're not all one. We're a lot of different parts that got to come together to make that one. And where those parts come together is where we a lot of times have challenges. And so pay attention to the edges. That's where the failures occur. Uh, edges of different building systems, edges of our contracts and making sure that we got all the work in, in there. But most importantly, the edges of relationships. How do we work together to build these buildings and to solve the problems? And that's a skill that's very important as you advance your careers. So uh, pay attention to the edges. Uh, pay attention to the relationships. Okay, next slide. Uh, again, behavior matters. Uh, this is a design build project I did down in uh, in UCI Irvine on the campus. And uh, the, the neat thing about this project was uh, the clarity of the owner's uh, vision for the project. Uh, she said she wanted a Janice face building. And uh, I didn't know what that was. So I went to the Marion Webster's fifth edition, looked up Janice face, and it told me a building that had two different faces. And that uh, then I got it. It was a building for humanities. And so it was sort of the smiling face on one side, the frowning face on the other. So the building had a, a very bland, conservative face on one side that faces the campus. And then it had this side of the building that uh, the uh, the dean said it looked like a jelly donut that had oozed out its all its goo, and that was a Janice face building she was looking for. So understanding um, what it what the uh, the vision for the project is and acting in a professional manner. Uh, I put the behavior up here because a lot of times there's a lot of friction in the design and construction industry as we point fingers at each other when there may be problems. And uh, that doesn't work. You got to have a professional respect for your uh, your partners, both on the design and construction side, as well as your owners, and approach it with a, a high degree of integrity and, and ethical behavior. I think there was a question of, uh, that was going to come up about uh, what does a designer or an architect or even a builder owe the owner uh, from a design perspective, and that's pr prudent design and construction guidance. So a high degree of ethics is important as you advance your career. Okay, next uh, slide. Uh, it's all about the team. 
Uh, we like to say that we're important and we all are important to the project, but it's about the team. Uh, the U.S., although this is not the U.S. Olympic women's Olympic team, uh, the U.S. women's Olympic team was a dynasty. Uh, they would win year after year after year after year, but they never had the same rowers on the same team. But what it was was that they knew what the team uh, required, uh, what their cadence was, uh, how to get across the finish line, what their roles and responsibilities were, whether it was steering the boat, was it the power stroke, or was it the person given the cadence? And that's what it takes to be successful in the design and construction industry, especially when you're the hybrid uh, moving back and forth between design and construction. Okay, next slide. Um, and what I'll say that uh, with the, the students I see coming out of the universities these days, they're, they're so much more advanced than I was when I graduated back in 1982. Um, greater technical skills, uh, virtual design and construction, which is uh, really uh, been very impactful in the construction side of the business. Uh, they bring innovation, they bring creativity, and they bring that innocence that's sometimes lost in the, in the mature firm to bring that, uh, you know, why not try this? Why not question it? Why not do things differently? Um, this project you see on the right uh, was, uh, and now it's an old project, 20 years old, 20 plus years old, uh, but that took a lot of skills of a lot of people in order to affect uh, that uh, project delivery in the short uh, compressed schedule it needed to be done. There was no room for error. There was no room for uh, missing the targets or else the football game would have had been played somewhere else and that was not going to be acceptable. So uh, working as a team, uh, that's what you got to look for. That's where the opportunities are, whether it's uh, on the design side and the construction side or on the design build side, there's opportunity and there's, uh, but it takes that team approach. Okay, last slide, I think. Uh, uh, I love this quote from Alvar Alto. Nothing is as dangerous in architecture as dealing with separated problems. And that's the absolute truth. When we work together to solve problems, to also to identify problems and then collectively solve them, uh, those are the most successful projects. And there's where you... Uh, reach the highest level of architectural and design excellence and construction excellence as, as when we work together. With that, thank you very much. Thank you, Greg. I agree with everything you said. So moving on now to the next presentation, Grace. Welcome, Grace. Hello, everyone. Um, I will be sharing my screen. Okay, so up. it's not up yet. All right, there, all we, right. There, there we go. All right, thank you. You're all able to see, and thank you very much. And hello, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me on today. First of all, I want to thank Rana, and I commend you for your leadership and for organizing this event. It's a privilege to be on this panel with a constellation of esteemed colleagues to talk about diverse career opportunities for diverse architects through a diversity of project delivery methods. I am Grace Lin. I used to work for global architectural companies. I held several positions before as a designer and a project architect. Then one day, one of my clients requested a former boss of mine to have me promoted to project manager. Shortly after that, the same year, I was promoted to senior project manager because of my energy, strong work ethic, and problem-solving abilities. I value that trust and committed myself to strive for excellence and serving my clients even better. That propelled my decision to pursue my master's degree in construction administration gaining more knowledge in construction and understanding my clients' needs and challenges built the foundation of my customer care. I worked very closely with owners, putting myself in their shoes until I became 
one of them. In 2010, I shifted to the owner side and started my career as a project manager representing Columbia University Irving Medical Center. There, I enjoyed managing the capital improvement programs, supporting the facilities and curriculum transformations, and advancing research and patient care, all crucial to the institution and the community. There, I oversaw the entire development process of capital projects, from planning to implementation to occupancy. There, I pursued my second master's degree, this time in sustainability management. There, I earned invaluable hands-on experience being on the owner's side, making business decisions. Six years later, an opportunity came from CBRE, a global real estate service company where I currently perform full-time as a senior project manager. Here, I enjoy the privilege of enabling clients to make informed decisions while I serve as an owner's advisor. Speaking about CBRE, I'd like to thank my boss for being with us today. He is here tonight. So thank you, Charles. Um, carrying on, in 2018, Columbia University offered me a faculty position to teach graduate level students under the Master of Science in Construction Administration program at the School of Professional Studies. As an adjunct professor, I also help my alma mater to advance cohorts of minority business owners under the university's CU Grow Vendor Development Program for the design and construction industry. I'm affiliated with the Association of Medical Facility Professionals, Urban Land Institute, Design Build uh, Professionals, DBIA. Uh, I'm one of the, uh, I'm a member of the Owners Committee. And last but not least, as Rana mentioned, I'm a member of the AIA Project Delivery Knowledge Community. I have many colleagues here today, and it's a pleasure to be with you. This is a rare moment, it's really unique, and I enjoy it. Okay, so here are some career opportunities for consideration, and there are many non-traditional options. For example, a teaching career, a building code specialist, a department of buildings plans examiner, a campus facility planner, and a project manager for real estate development. Young professionals may consider non-traditional roles that align with their passion whatever they choose. It is important that they enjoy doing what they do. So to get to work being enthusiastic and feeling accomplished almost every day, if not every day. Some may choose to cultivate their entrepreneurial mind and consider operating their own business and possibly seek better income. Many states and cities require the engagement of diverse firms, such as MWBEs, to meet their diversity and inclusion goals generally at 30% here in New York where I am based. However, this is changing as more organizations are now setting a higher purpose to increase MWBE participation. These non-traditional opportunities come with challenges as well. As many of you know, the only change is constant. When professionals take charge of their own career paths, by continuously developing new skills, they are being proactive to adapt to change. By embracing lifelong learning, they are developing career resilience. When it comes to salary ranges, they can vary widely. And this table shows a comparison between architectural practice and building and construction professionals that is based in New York City and a senior project manager position. Both datasets were sourced from salary.com and both were published on the same day, August 29, 2022. As you can see, the average salary under the building and construction category is about 10% more than ar the architectural practice. However, outside of architectural practice, salary ranges do vary depending on many factors, including education, certifications, additional skills, expertise, and years of experience in the industry, as well as market sectors. A senior project manager 
outside of architectural practice can get compensated higher than what's shown on the table. Architects can play a significant role in enabling owners to make informed decisions. And here are some examples. An owner architect can be involved in many functions. To name a few, architects can lead the strategic planning, campus master planning, program development, project delivery system, setting performance criteria and building standards, and help owners define their vision for their built environment future and meet their organizational facility goals and requirements. Same as what our colleagues Laura as well as Greg had mentioned earlier. As project managers for owners, architects can innovate project delivery solutions as well and help owners navigate through the changing AEC market landscape. Owner architect can also provide project management services to oversee the planning, design, and construction of capital projects. Owner architect can also manage buildings and enable owner informed decisions on the resources for SOGR, that's the state of good repair, as well as budget allocations for facility maintenance, building systems upgrades, uh, furniture replacement, and also interior cosmetic upgrades. Furthermore, architects can assist owners in leading the execution of a range of project delivery methods and implementing the project from start to finish. This is one of the important functions that help sustain architects' practice into the future. The role of the architect can vary depending on the project del delivery models such as shown on this, uh, in these three buckets. On the design build build, the owner architect administers the RFQ and the RFP processes, onboards the design consultant, and assembles the team, then manages the design process and takes it to the bidding phase to engage a builder, thereafter administers construction up to closeout. On the CM at risk model, the owner architects onboard CM and design consultants at the same time through separate RFPs and separate service agreements. The owner architect manages the design process and ensures the project does not exceed the budget. The owner architect facilitates the construction bidding and GC engagement, then administers construction and takes it to project closeout. On design build, the owner architect administers the RFQ and RFP processes to procure the designer and builder as one team under one contract. After assembling the design build team, the owner architect oversees design and construction, conducts project controls and ensures projects are on time and on budget and delivers the project up to closeout. Thus far, I have been enjoying the unique combination of my experiences of having performed as an owner and an architect. The qualify, that qualified my skills and perspectives, which are meaningful and invaluable for catalyzing real estate development. According to Steve Jobs, the only way to do great work is to love what you do. If you haven't found it yet, don't settle keep looking. Because if you are passionate about what you do, nothing can obstruct you from achieving greatness. So stay optimistic, tuned in, and be ready to embrace potential non-traditional opportunities as they arise. With that, thank you all. Very inspiring. Thank you, Grace. You're welcome. Hi, welcome. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for having me here. Uh, so I work for Turner Construction uh, as a regional design build uh, manager. Uh, Turner Construction is a, 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 one of the largest general contractors in the country, uh, doing total volume of $15 billion uh, a year. In my role uh, with Turner Construction, I act as a overall um, strategy and implementation for design build pursuits 
management and culture, team selection and formation, uh, management of design uh, risk and uh, implementation and bridge the gap between design and construction. Uh, my story is a little unconventional. My career path has been uh, a little bit of a winding road to different ways to go with things. Um, I started out uh, originally in civil engineering. Um, it wasn't necessarily for me. I went through it uh, two years and it wasn't exactly um, being as, uh, having it applied it wasn't as inspiring. Um, so I looked at different career paths and different uh, suggestions, recommendations. And one thing that what I did is I, I bought a book uh, that changed my life. It's called Becoming an Architect by Lee Waldrop. Um, in this book, he uh, interviewed uh, over 40 individu individuals who all had one commonality, and that's what they studied architecture. And uh, they went from being a wildlife painter to a photographer, to an architect, to a design builder. Um, so there's so many different paths that architecture uh, in the profession that you can take or tangents that you can take from uh, the study of architecture. You have a well-rounded to the degree that uh, offers a plethora of possibilities. Um, in this uh, book, um, the commonality that I found within a lot of the uh, different people that were interviewed was that they had wished that they studied uh, construction management either uh, in undergrad or in, in a master's program. Um, and I knew that my civil engineering program had a uh, construction management uh, emphasis as well, and it's something that we could do. So in that, um, I, I, I uh, went into that field and I, I fell in love immediately. I think what really was missing for me was the applied application of what we had studied. Uh, there's something uh, romantic about, uh, you know, getting up in the morning and you smelling, uh, you know, concrete being poured, metal studs being cut. It's the smell of progress, the smell of actually being able to see your labors and all the hard work that you put forth being changed and changing the built environment. And you get to touch so many different industries. You learn a lot about healthcare, about uh, clean room manufacturing, uh, aviation, uh, offices, everything like that. There's, there's so many different ways. Um, every project's new, every client's different. Uh, their needs and understanding their priorities is really what's inspiring and impactful with that. Um, and so through that process, um, you know, I, I completed my bachelor's in structure management. And my idea, um, one of the, the chapters that I had read in the book was a design build. Um, a chapter and it was Randy Thorpe with FC and Architects that um, really inspired me to see what the route was where you could integrate design and construction um, because at, at that point I had worked for uh, architects and some internships that wasn't exactly um, you know the applied application I was looking for and so from there I, I went to do my master's in architecture um, and I studied and completed that while working for Turner Construction um, and that opened doors for me to see uh, the possibilities with design build. I, I kind of saw on the horizon early in my career that that was becoming a uh, project delivery method of choice. But I liked the collaboration. I liked the breaking down the silos. Um, and so that was something that I had positioned myself to. Um, and so when the opportunity came along um, where we've got more design build work locally, um, it really served me well to position myself for that. Um, currently, I'm also furthering my education and uh, doing my master's of uh, real estate development at Georgetown. And that's opening up another uh, possibilities and just another perspective is what does the client's uh, inputs and outputs are and what, what do they need in the process? And so by even studying architecture, it really allowed me to understand what my peers needed um, on each side of the aisle. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so just a little bit of like things that served me well, and I, I can talk a little bit about my career path. Um, so I've, uh, I've had a couple architectural internships, um, and I also uh, have worked for Turner for 15 years in a variety of roles, uh, starting in with estimating and field engineering, uh, different hospital construction, uh, cost management, project management, pre-construction management, design build management, and really what, through all these uh, different roles, and I, I, you know, you, you can borrow and learn things that apply to one another. So, um, you know, learning project scheduling, it really is helpful for me to uh, facilitate and talk with uh, designers and, and engineers on how to prioritize tasks to, 
that are most important, not necessarily, uh, you know, working on things that maybe it's uh, what's, what's most important for the overall procurement and buyout of the job. So a lot of times I, um, my, my role as a design manager is, you know, I'm a therapist, I'm a janitor, um, you know, I'm, a, you know, a decoder ring, uh, you know, really just figuring out different ways to facilitate and integrate the team. Um, and so sometimes I have to, uh, you know, talk to with my Turner team about what's, you know, what are the really priorities or motivations for the design team. And sometimes I have to talk to the design team about what are the priorities uh, for the construction and overall project health and schedule. Um, and so some things in my career that have really served me well is, is just dreaming big, you know, just make up big goals and go for it. If you miss out on them, if you don't hit all your targets, that's okay. I mean, as long as you're striving to get better, you know, 1% every day, uh, it's really, you're, you're, you're achieving, you're on your way and really be open to possibilities and to, um, different opportunities. You may, you might never know what, um, you know, a new opportunity could bring to you a new perspective, uh, something that you can take as a, uh, another thing in your tool belt and uh, develop skills that maybe your other peers haven't been exposed to. And I would say be genuine uh, in your dealings, in your authenticity as a person. Uh, character in this industry is everything. Your credibility, your reputation as a person, and how you deal with conflict, how you deal with uh, situations. You know, it's not all sunshines and rainbows when you go through things but if if you are genuine and ethical and how you conduct your business and how you're fair with people uh people are going to want to work with you and they're going to uh, want to work together to find equitable solutions and i would say just be bold um just get, get yourself out there uh don't worry about failing uh and if you fail get back up and, and try all over again i failed plenty in my career and you know and and it's it served me well. You learn lessons every single time um, and you grow from them. And I would say that, the, you know, ask questions. Uh, don't be afraid of not knowing, uh, you know, especially when you're early in your career, you, you're, you're expected not to know. You know, I, as any intern that I've ever had, I've always been, uh, you know, appreciative of the ones that ask me tough questions because they're trying to get better. They're trying to understand. And it really helps uh, both myself and them uh, with their development. And, uh, you know, hard work and pre uh, perseverance pays off. So don't ever give up. Um, even in, in the times where you want to quit, just keep pushing through and, and it will happen. Things will, things, good things will happen. And uh, what I would also say is don't be afraid to change course. If you don't know what, uh, maybe what you're, you're doing and uh, as far as like what you want to do with your career, just keep seeking out there. Like what Grace was saying, like do what you love, find out what you would love to do. Uh, and because at the end of the day, if you're doing what you love, it doesn't feel like work for me. Uh, you know, doing civil engineering internship, it wasn't necessarily what I wanted to do. I kept looking at the clock every single day <laughs> and multiple times and it, was, it just, the days didn't go by very fast. And now in construction, I look at the clock and I'm, I'm like, where, where did the day go? What do you mean it's already, you know, two o'clock? I have so many more things to do. So uh, if you're doing what you love, it, it doesn't really feel like work. It, I mean, uh, you know, it can be hard, it can be time consuming, but it's really rewarding and fulfilling. And um, I would say is, uh, in, in, in construction in general, there's a lot of risks, there's a lot of uh, worries and stress. Um, and what I always tell my staff is, uh, worry about what you can control. Uh, if, if you can actively change the outcome of it and affect it, sure, worry about it, work on it, um, manage it, um, resolve it. But if it's something that's out of your hands, then it's out of your control and, it's, and you worrying about it nothing's going to uh, positively impact it. There's nothing you can do about it. So at the same, you, you just have to worry about what's in your realm of influence. And next slide, please. So, uh, yeah, if you have any questions, I'm available. You can, uh, this is my contact information. Um, happy to, uh, you know, be here as a sounding board for any of you with the, if you have any career advice or uh, questions at all. Um, happy to be that part. And uh, thank you all uh, for having me on this panel. That was great, Kyle. Thank, thank you so much. I know you're in transit. Thank you for joining us anyway. Michael, welcome. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. Uh, 
So just a little bit about myself, as you can see from the bio, uh, I work at UC San Diego. I'm in their capital program management department. And I came there in 2008, initially to focus on the Jacobs Medical Center, which was the largest capital project that we've had to date on campus. And I'm currently in a role of a uh, program manager focusing on sort of the business operations within our department. So a lot of what I do deals with our project management systems, standards, uh, project controls, how we manage risk, things like that. I know Greg mentioned in his presentation, I wrote this down, like the edges are where the failures occur. And I find that that's where my career is being spent. I'm in the gaps between the edges trying to bridge a lot of what we do and how we hand off different parts of the project and even uh, hand it over to the end users at the end, uh, transition into operations. I'm, I've been active in AIA over the years at all levels. Uh, currently, I'm the vice president of the COA California chapter, Construction Owners Association of America. So it's an organization of, uh, of owners. Typically, a uh, majority of the members are universities. But one of the things I think that's uh, interesting about the group is they focus heavily on sort of what the values of a good owner would be. And I think that's one of the things we do very successfully at UC San Diego. We're active members of the team. We're there with the architects and the contractors. Uh, risk is shared. And it's a very, very engaging, very interactive process that we have. So I'm gonna go to the next slide. I wanted to talk a little bit about my career path uh, because I didn't really expect to be where I am right now. Uh, like most architects, I get out of college. You know, I started working for architectural firms of different sizes, uh, different project types, gradually moved to larger firms and began sort of honing my skills more in healthcare architecture and focusing on project management specifically. That's where my strengths were. And I began focusing there. So I kind of I moved through in a variety of different roles and uh, moved out here to California from Ohio. And eventually in 2007, landed my dream job. I was recruited by a firm to be their director of operations for their healthcare practice. So it combined everything that I thoroughly enjoyed doing. So I was really excited to get started with that. But in the back of my mind, you know, I, I kept thinking about changes that I had made uh, along the way, uh, firms that I had moved from and to. And there's sort of this nagging feeling that there were things about traditional practice that I just didn't really care for. Uh, and moving from one firm to another didn't necessarily solve the problem. It just typically shifted it to another, you know, another issue, another, uh, another thing that was sort of a level of frustration. And then in 2008, we had the Great Recession, which was a sea change for pretty much everyone in the profession. And I found myself laid off for the first time in my career. Uh, it never happened before and was uh, absolutely terrifying at the time with everything that was going on with the economy. It just so happened I was working on a project at UCSD and called my client uh, that evening to tell them that I was laid off. I wasn't going to be attending the upcoming meetings that we had. And they said, well, you know, we've got this big project coming up was the Jacobs Medical Center and we're hiring. You know, you might be interested. So they connected me with uh, the director of healthcare, And within a couple of weeks, I was on board as a consulting project manager helping out on that project. So first 22 years of my career in traditional practice, 14 years and going here in the public sector at UCSD. And it just, uh, there's something about that role that really clicked for me. You know, I had moved from uh, uh, starting out as a you know, young architect, learning more about uh, design and construction, moving into more project management. And I felt like I was sort of starting to separate a bit from uh, the day-to-day -day on some of the projects. When I hit uh, the operational role, I thought, you know, this is kind of it. I'm really, I'm, I'm now more in a management role and I'm not uh, dealing with projects on a daily basis. And I thought for sure that, you know, moving into the private sector or I'm sorry, public sector, working on these projects, that was going to be absolutely the end of that and was pleasantly surprised to find out that wasn't the case. 
So when I go to that next slide, I'll talk a little bit about uh, some of the career paths there are within colleges and universities. And a lot of this depends on, I'm kind of following a little bit of what we have at UCSD and uh, it varies by uh, organization and how the, the campus is structured in terms of where roles fall. Uh, we do not have a uh, school of architecture. Uh, it's, so we're just basically focused on uh, uh, the majors that we have at the university. But the, the main category is you talk about you know, design and planning. You have the campus architect, campus planner, capital building programs, which is where I'm located in, uh, within the university. Uh, facilities and operations, which uh, basically takes ownership of the building after we turn it over and take it through the rest of its lifespan. And then again, you do have the academic side of this uh, with department leadership, professor, uh, and so forth. And each one of these things, uh, it, it's layered. I mean, you can go in at a, more of an entry level and work your way up, probably with the exception of the uh, campus architect, campus planner, which is more of a later career move that people make. So within the capital building program, uh, we, uh, we manage uh, close to a billion dollars of design and construction a year. I think our Capital program is uh, it's gone. It's increased from a seven billion dollar program up to close to eleven, with some of the projects that we have ongoing. Uh, the campus has uh, grown in size. Uh, student uh, populations increased dramatically. So naturally, we need to build housing. We need to build educational space and all the infrastructure to deal with that. So it's a sizable program. I mean, our department is close to 80 people. So if you think of that in comparison to a, a traditional firm, that's a sizable firm to manage. And that includes our project managers, department leadership. We also have a fiscal department uh, for accounting, a contractual department that manages all of the uh, uh, processing of our contracts. And we're also for uh, state pro or for campus projects, not uh, healthcare, we're also the authority having jurisdiction. So we have uh, 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 a building official and we also have uh, uh, inspectors on the projects as well. So it's a pretty sizable operation. Facilities and operations, uh, that's something that uh, I know some architects do get involved in, but uh, you know, that's, we deliver the project and I think, you know, coming back to uh, what it was like in uh, traditional practice, the delivery of the project, completing that, the move in by the, by the owner, that was sort of the culmination of everything. But when you're the owner that uh, owns and maintains these buildings over time, that's really just the beginning. I mean, it's a high point, but now you've got you know, 50, 60 years of ongoing uh, maintenance, construction, renovation, things that you're doing. So the role of the facility planner and facility manager come into play there as well. Uh, from a salary range standpoint, uh, it's it, we're a public entity. So in, uh, in all of those, the salaries are published. Uh, they, uh, they work in ranges based on uh, level of expertise. So you kind of like common nomenclature, you'd say like a project manager one, project manager two, three, et cetera. And those gradually move up in terms of salary bracket, uh, but they are published. The range I posted there somewhere you know, represents roughly, I would say uh, a few years of experience in project management all the way up to uh, leader of a department, something along those lines. And, you know, I think that, uh, you know, it's actually, it's, it's been an interesting shift in career from a standpoint that it's one of the first times in my life that I've actually experienced real work-life balance to where uh, your uh, uh, time away from the office is valued that high by the organization. So that's been really good. And like I said, it was very surprising to uh, find out that uh, I actually felt more involved in the projects. I didn't feel removed from them. I was uh, on the medical center. I was more engaged in 
the uh, design of the project than I typically would have been. And in an owner role, you're really setting the tone for how the team works. Uh, you've established the contract, you've established the rules of engagement. And like I said, we're there right along with the team presenting the projects, helping lead things through when mistakes are made. We're part of the, we're part of the party that made the mistakes. So we're right there with everyone else. <clears throat> And I think, you know, it's like myself, I came in probably mid-career. I think at the end of this, I will have spent, uh, when I retire, I will have spent about, <clears throat> excuse me, half of my career in traditional practice and half in, uh, in the public sector. And I think that uh, depending upon when people transition in, the salary range may or may not be a, uh, an obstacle. But the one thing that's nice, I mean, although salary does tend to get a little bit separated from performance because it follows a path in terms of the salary range. I think the one thing that is nice is that the benefits are there for you long term. There's excellent benefits year over year in terms of holidays, vacation, things like that. Uh, you know, uh, I think uh, time spent on uh, career advancement, education, things along those lines. But in reality, it's like the best opportunity that you have for a fully like robust retirement because you're not tied to just a 401k and a small match by, a, by an owner or by the owner of the firm. You're actually getting a sizable uh, contribution to that year over year. And from the UC system, it's based on years of service in terms of where you are at retirement. You know, I think that uh, I think that one of the best things about being in a university like this, though, is that you get to do uh, in private practice. It was always based on the project. You would uh, you know, some projects were great, some projects not so great, but it was always sort of feast and famine. I mean, you would try and build up enough work. Uh, to keep the practice going, but then that would start to fall away. You would have uh, cycles in the economy where uh, things would get pretty rough. But where we are right now, we get to work with the best of the best. So we get to work with the best design firms on the best projects and truly doing their best work. And I think one of the things that really amazes me is I look at uh, the students on campus, and those are actually all of our future clients at some point. And those students are, uh, they're experiencing spaces that we put on campus and buildings and uh, just the campus in general, uh, the environment there, they're ex experiencing something that's going to change their outlook on what's possible. So when they go out into uh, sort of the corporate world and they're starting to look at uh, facilities and things they need to do for their business, you know, I, I think that it's really gonna change their outlook on what could be there and what's really important. Some of the facilities they do on campus are amazing for the dormitories and the uh, mixed use facilities that we have. But uh, yeah, I think life uh, sometimes throws you curves when it's least expected. It uh, pushed me in a direction that I was very happy that I went in and that's my uh, goal will be to stay here and finish out the rest of my career doing really exciting work. So uh, thank you. Thank you, Michael, that, that was just great. Greg said think outside of the box and you said you, uh, you know, catch the curveballs. So I guess <laughs> our business is kind of, it's kind of out of the box <laughs> and curvy. <laughs> So with that, Amani, uh, welcome. Thank you. Uh, hello, everybody. Um, really glad to be here. And uh, thank you so much, Rana, for inviting me. And uh, just uh, in terms of uh, beyond the uh, nuts and bolts of my career, what I'd like to talk a little bit about is the trend, you know, is how does an architect become a program project construction manager and why? And in order to try to get to that, I would start off with uh, 
you know, when I was, I did my architecture undergrad in India, a very small class, we had only, uh, only 11 of us. And I remember how passionate we were about art, being an architect. And that was what, you know, we are studying and learning. And, uh, and uh, there were a couple of our classmates who are not that much into it. They got into architecture, maybe by default, so to speak, by mistake. And they were talking about how they'll get their degree and go do maybe structural engineering or something else. And we really thought that they're not being true to the cause of architecture because, and we, we believe totally, you know, we were reading Fountainhead and seeing what a great profession architecture is. And that's all we wanted to do. And, uh, and so in terms of uh, uh, the, at that point, at least, I did not know that there are other alternatives once you, be, you know, once you study and learn architecture. But uh, one other reason I think uh, a certain deviation happened, at least from my career standpoint, is, uh, is uh, how good are you in design, right? And we had a couple of uh, our classmates who are, you can say they can, you know, they could be signature architects in terms of their talent and design and creativity and so on. I was good at it and I probably was not, definitely not anywhere at that caliber. So I wasn't sure that I couldn't really excel in design at the top level. And I thought I had other strengths in terms of communication, writing and speaking and so on and so forth. So there was something in the back of the mind, I think during the architectural education also in terms of uh, a sense of something uh, beyond uh, uh, design, uh, focused on design. And uh, then when I uh, came to, I, I wanted to get do my master's in the United States and I went to University of Illinois and uh, they had a specialization within the architectural, master of architecture program. You can obviously major in, you know, be, be, be design be the focus, but they had a program called architect, architectural administration and building technology. And some of that appealed to me uh, that I wanted to be in architecture and, and then some, so to speak. And that was a great program. It really broadened my horizons quite a bit. I did take a design class, uh, which I didn't have to, but I still did. And then I was exposed to some other things. Like I took a course in civil engineering uh, on CPM scheduling, because some of that felt like that's something I wanted to learn. So that's kind of the beginnings of getting towards uh, something besides architecture. And uh, I did start my career in architecture, uh, but, uh, but deviated from it when I got an opportunity actually to start my career as a scheduler for a construction management firm. And this is, I'm talking about late 70s. So the profession of construction management was very, very young at that time. And I was fortunate enough to be uh, getting involved in it at that early times and uh, actually kind of help grow the profession, so to speak, or be, and grow with it is a better way of saying that. And, uh, and so definitely, I think uh, my focus on what I want to talk about today is to really explain in a, in a very big picture, high level standpoint, what is in fact, what is program project construction management? And uh, so, yeah, let's go to the first slide. And uh, so in a essence, and I wanted to really summarize everything that we do from cradle to grave, from concept to close out and occupancy into one slide and 72 words. So what I see our profession to be is that we engage with the owner when they have a facility related need, it could be a renovation or new need or it, uh, and so on. We help them clarify and define their goals and needs and uh, which I believe is a very fundamental, important part of uh, us setting up a program or a project for success is to help uh, the owner synthesize their needs and have clarity on their goals. Uh, the, the goals can be, you know, obviously the goals are, you know, will relate to the scope and the budget and the schedule, but go whole goals go beyond that. We uh, explore what, uh, what is success to them? What is, you know, how do you define success earlier on? 
uh, in terms of the, uh, you know, it could be uh, community uh, happiness, it could be uh, longevity, it could be sustainability, it could be lots of different things as to what is it that done, or it could be a signature uh, architectural masterpiece, it could be lots of different things. So really think that at that point to engage with the owners to defining their goals and needs goes, is very fundamental to laying the foundation for overall program and project success. And then so based on that understanding, we develop a broad scope of the program or project, you know, come up with the master level budget and the master schedule. Uh, once those frameworks are in place and understanding and aligning, uh, uh, then we define what, what can be an implementation strategy that will include uh, how are we going to procure uh, the facility uh, uh, in terms of uh, uh, is it going to be a design bid bill, design bill, CM address, uh, progressive design bill? What would be the right approach to achieve, again, the owner's goals uh, becomes the next step. And once the implementation strategy is defined and articulated in a program or a project management plan, we work with the owner and uh, to procure the necessary consultants and contractors, builders, uh, depending upon, again, the procurement system. And once, uh, then we manage the processes and people during all the stages, pre-design, design, procurement, construction, and occupancy in such a manner that they are consistent with the established goals, scope, budget, and schedule. So that, to me, is what our overall business is. Um, but of course, this is the most comprehensive level of what we do, or we'd like to do, I would rather say, as a program project construction manager. In most cases, we don't have the, uh, uh, the uh, privilege to get in uh, as early as we would like to engage with the owners uh, to really you know, set the foundations. Lots of the time we are uh, brought in uh, at various stages in the, in the game. Um, uh, but again, you know, you got, we still, when we come in between, we definitely take the time uh, to understand the goals and needs before we engage. It doesn't matter when we come on because we believe that learning the goals, our whole business uh, to us is to understand what the owner goals are and try like hell and do whatever you can, you can to help them achieve those goals. And that will be the to us, that will be success if the owners achieve their goals. So you can see that there is a lot of, you know, it's very congruent or it's, you know, it's very consistent with what a architectural mindset is, I believe, because as architect, we all want to understand what is the owner want, what are they trying to do and how do you solve that in terms of developing a, 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 a facility uh, our spaces that will address that. I think that we we focus more on the processes and the uh, and everything that goes together to make that spaces come alive and uh, function as they're intended. So if you can go to the next slide, it's uh, so quite a lot of the time uh, we do come on later in the stage. So in terms of the understanding the terminology. So if, if you say we are doing construction management, yes, we do. We still want to help define uh, goals or understand goals based on when we are on board. But we, in many projects, are limited to coming on board to just at the construction phase. So we are managing that the processes and people during the construction and occupancy phase so that they are consistent with the goals, scope, budget, and schedule. And the next slide, please. And when we talk about project management, uh, once again, you know, we are talking about coming on board where we are helping them with the pre-design, design, procurement, construction, and occupancy so that they are with the goals and uh, scope, budget, and schedule. So in terms of what, when we talk on our program management, uh, I have had the opportunity to work at the program level, which really encompasses everything that we're talking about here, a client with the multiple projects, 
and so you have to establish an umbrella of uh, of standards and uh, policies procedures systems that can create consistency for all of the projects and processes that's a that that again is a part of our overall approach you know to serving the clients in the industry uh, in, in terms of a, from a program management standpoint next slide So as I talk about what are the range of services, uh, obviously there is a program, project, and construction management, and uh, and then there are some specialized aspects the, that within that in terms of if you talk about uh, a career path of what you can do, schedule management. While it is part of program, project, construction management, it is a, can be a service unto itself, and there are uh, people who uh, have do men make a pretty good living and have a great career as being schedulers and and it is a field which is uh, not as well populated as as the demand will require and uh, and they were talking about salaries you can make some good money being a scheduler with that specialized skill and expertise if that's the uh, passion or uh, that somebody has as i said i started my career as scheduler but I wanted to be not be specialized. I wanted to be more involved in the bigger picture of management. So uh, I I made the shift from that to the project management and program management. Cost management has two aspects to it. One of them is obviously being estimating. Uh, other one is managing the budget and setting up the systems and processes in place to ensure that we are tracking and consistent with the uh, with the established budget and design and constructability review again it's a specialized uh, uh, service and I think an architectural background can be a great uh, strength to do that and of course you know in some cases program project management uh, we we have at least I have uh, Develop some master plans, which was uh, which goes a little bit beyond, uh, you know, into the implementation of uh, the master plan for large multi-facility clients. Those things are, I think, maybe those are the exceptions rather than the rule, but it can be, especially if there is a good architectural skills resides in the team in the company. Those particular assignments are not out of the picture. And besides that, you know, we've got program controls and project controls, uh, 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 but they are very related to each other. If the, if the skill level is more into information management and data analysis and, uh, and, and passion for uh, computers and their apl applications, that will be another aspect of what can be a good fit for uh, for those uh, for in our overall professional program project and construction management next please in terms of so what kind of a market segments that are available uh, and uh, i got just, this is you know real big picture obviously there are so many different market segments this is not beyond what i have here but primarily at least on the public sector side there's education which goes from k12 to K-14 uh, and then higher education. We heard from UC San Diego. Uh, on the justice side, there are the prisons, uh, the jails and juvenile halls. Also, there's a whole court system. That's when I, uh, Rana uh, was in judicial council for a long time. Right now, I'm working with the judicial council at the program management level. And uh, on the civic side, it's a kind of a catch-all of, you know, it can include office buildings, administrative buildings, uh, libraries, fire stations, uh, community centers, and so on. And healthcare, obviously, is, you know, hospitals, MOBs, and the like. Obviously, there are other things beyond that. And, you know, into the transportation uses a lot of CM services. Purely from an architectural standpoint, obviously the terminals, the airport terminals, and uh, 
like the mass transit uh, stations could be uh, something where the vertical skilled uh, people can engage. And uh, again, on the private side, obviously there are labs and uh, data centers and so on and so forth. But generally, at least in my experience, the, the public sector clients are more uh, inclined to use program project consult con construction management consultants and the private sectors do use it. Kaiser in here does use it. Man, like some of the bigger, large private owners like Microsoft and uh, Intel do use construction management. But uh, overall in the industry, I would say that the percentage of public sector owners using our services is much greater than the private sector owners. So in terms of uh, trying to wrap my pres uh, uh, presentation, I want, you know, I would really make a strong case that, you know, what makes a good program project construction manager? I may be prejudiced because I'm an architect and I'm also talking to a bunch of architects here, but I really think that with uh, a lot of uh, respect to our colleagues who are so successful, you know, coming from a civil engineering or other engineering or even a construction management as a degree, I really think that at least in the vertical space of construction management, I'm not, I'm going to not include the infrastructure in here. Architects are in fact, well said to be a very effective project construction manager because of multiple reasons. You know, we know how a building goes together right off the bat. We don't have to learn all the systems and components of what a building is. Uh, we have the bigger picture. I think our, and as an architect, we think about what's the owner, what's the owner's needs and goals, how do I meet it? And, uh, and the ability to work with the team is a very essential part of architecture. So I would say that, again, let's go to my last, uh, last slide, uh, is architects make super program project and construction managers. Thanks, Rona, and everybody else. I'm glad you have a, 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 a female there, that, that, that's good. And I, I thank you all, that, that really covered, of course, everything, if you look at us, we're all different types of people, different generations, different career paths, different educational paths, uh, different um, uh, uh, personal, family, uh, racial, demographic backgrounds and abilities. And, uh, and then of course, we've, we've all had careers in varied sectors. So before we uh, uh, open to Q and A, and I see we have one question that came in and I had a few questions for the panel, but I'll hold those. We wanna do a couple of quick polls, which I probably should have done in the beginning. So Rebecca, if you wanted to polls a real quick pace, less than a minute, just to get a feel of who we have with us today. So if you could answer the polls and then we'll, we'll see, we'll see um, what we have here. I, forgive me if I didn't um, cover everything, but we tried to be broad in the demographics. So Rebecca, uh, ha, these are not, oh, I see. Okay, thank you. Please answer, thanks. The poll closed. I think it told me that panelists and the host can't vote. <laughs> Correct. Okay. How are you doing, Rebecca? Well, it looks like we've got about 50% of the participants who have completed there, so we are well on our way. That's not to say that architectural participants aren't decisive about polls. So while we're waiting, I had a few, I had a few takeaways from our colleagues. Just I tried to put down one or two words from each of you that stood out for me. 
you know, starting starting on the uh, with money, try like hell to achieve your goals. That that's great. A Kyle, dream big. Greg, watch the edges. I hadn't really thought about what we do as the edges, but I think it's 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 totally apt. Laura, focus and the mission. Grace, don't settle. Keep exploring. So ready to ready to do the polls and then we'll we'll, we'll take some questions and then think. I can um, just give everyone about 30 more seconds and we'll give everyone a think think like, think like Filippo Brunelleschi. It's one of those timeless places. You know, people ask me about what's a timeless place, you know, a place that just takes takes you away here in California. Well, the Sundial Bridge in Reading, it's just one of those places. You just you, you can't believe it. And, and it, it, it takes you away. And of course, there are many other types of structures that are just like that. So we have a couple of questions. Let's start with our participants' questions. And then I had a few questions for the panelists too. And just tell me when you're ready to put the poll up. So Stephanie's asking, Stephanie, welcome. Stephanie is a member of our Urban Design Committee and a longtime senior planner in uh, Southern California. She's asking Mani, how do you see the overlap between the responsibilities of the construction manager as the architect as historically performed in those services? Uh, that's a good question. I think uh, I, I, am a, I, obviously there is, there can be an overlap, but I see that uh, an architect is, responsible obviously for the design and the production of the uh, uh, drawings and uh, specifications and so on and uh, we uh, as a program as a, a good construction manager would be should be i should say totally respectful of the architect's role in design and uh, with the uh, while providing guidance on what the design as it's heading it towards uh, in various stages of ev evolution relates to the other parameters of the project, such as the budget uh, schedule and other goals of the client. So we see ourselves, uh, and I think in our, our role is, uh, is to mine the overall project parameters and uh, do not interfere or be respectful of the architect's role as design and recognize the you know that the architect again depend upon the delivery method you know when it's a design build the dynamics is different but uh, but uh, but the architect's role as a designer uh, is respected and we do I, I really don't see that potentially that there is that much overlap as long as we are working together as a collaborative team rather than putting on different hats that I'm CM, your architect, but we are collaborating together as you know, in order to align ourselves, as I said, towards the owner's goals. So once we keep the owner's goals as the target that we are all moving towards, I think that'll be perfect alignment uh, where we can pull together the project towards that to achieve success. Uh, that I, I, I think that's true in, in some cases, but from Greg's standpoint, there could be a difference in the roles. Again, you say in, in terms of what type of contract it is, but what do you think, Greg? I yeah. mean, Depending on the contract, it, it's, there's a difference. Uh, one of the things that we look to the uh, uh, the construction manager or the owner's advisor in this uh, relationship is to make sure that we're on track with the owner's vision and the needs. So for example, are we getting, um, the owner puts out criteria and are we in compliance? How do we get help uh, meeting with the stakeholders to make sure we're getting all the uh, requirements into the program? So facilitating that interface between the owner and the design builder to close any gaps to make sure that um, all the design requirements are identified and that we can 
fulfill them. So um, it's a critical role uh, for that interface between the owner and the design builder to make sure that we're all aligned on the same uh, page. So a uh, very critical role. Uh, with that said, uh, if there isn't alignment with the team, then it can be uh, there can be a lot of friction in there. Um, and so it uh, it needs to be a very collaborative and uh, integrated approach. We're all working for the same goal at the end of the day, and that's the uh, success of the project for all parties. I, I, I think I think that's true too. And they, and because it's it's sort of one of the thorns in my side, I'm just going to 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 kill this one. I'm just going to ask Grace as the owners representative for healthcare, Michael would have the, an opinion about this too. Some, where sometimes the project managers are not that strong and sometimes they're powerful uh, personalities who might want to play the architect in disguise. So from the owner's standpoint, you know, Mani and everyone showed us sort of the range from cradle to grave of how you, how you the roles shift over the course of a project. What do you think is the greatest opportunity both inside and as a consultant to do both project management and construction management well and successfully, given what our two colleagues have, have responded with. Um, so I'll start. Okay, well, so I can give you the perspective of being a consultant as well as the perspective of being an owner. Um, I'll start with the owner position. Uh, being an owner, you have the insight of of the origin or the genesis of the project while it's still in in, uh, in in at its inception. So that insight is extremely valuable for you to be able to identify what resources you need. That is even way before the construction manager is put on board. Uh, so those are really critical ramping up the project while the consultants are not yet hired is an essential role of being in the owner side. Um, being on the consultant side, uh, it helps the or owner organization uh, fill the voids because organizations are built differently, uh, skill sets are different, culture is different. And so being a consultant, we need to be agile and be able to fill in the gaps uh, and help the client fulfill those roles that will help them ramp up the project. And these are examples of the early part of the project. And it's crucial, uh, you know, how we can play a role there. Architects also as inherently has this planning and design, you know, in our skill sets can also bring a lot of value during this early stage. Um, not to say towards the end or the middle, no value. Of course there are, but these examples are at what I'm citing right now is at the early stage, comparing a consultant's mm -hmm. role and com with an architect's uh, or rather owner architect's role. I hope that helps. Thank you, Grace. And before we take another question, we're just gonna look at the um, responses to the poll. We had, we had about 100 people registered and we have at least at least observably online about 88 people. So uh, why, why we joined? Let's see. Who got the first was, oh, here we go. I had to look at the polls. So generational demographic. Can we see the rest of it? I, I can only see the, um, the first two. Did we just do two, Rebecca? If you have your box up, you can scroll through each one and see oh, all Okay, eight. okay. Oh, I see. So mid-career, we weren't sure. Fe oh, female and male, about equal. That's really unusual. Backgrounds, not so different from the demographic AIA and National has just done a demographic study. Nick, Nikki tells us they do that every year and that'll be available to everyone 
and um, our board is hoping to work with the California Architects Board to do a dem demographics of the licensees in California, but it hasn't been done yet. Wow, look at that design bid build bar. That is shocking. Wow. I don't know, Greg, Kyle, Laura. I'm, I'm disappointed. Well, I also think that they just may not have been exposed yet. And so it's uh, yeah, yeah. more traditional methods will be more prevalent. Yeah, no, exactly. But, uh, so Rana, the question is asking, what experience do you have with different project methodologies? Right. So even if you're all doing design build, you have experience. Most of us have experience in design build build. So I don't know that I'll read too much into the 95% yeah. because- I'd, I'd agree. I think everybody started with design bid build. Design, mm -hmm. bid, build sometime. Yeah. And then you still that's do it. small projects. You do design yeah. build. Yeah. yeah, that's a good point. And then maybe, of course- Maybe the better question would, which would you be prefer to do? Mm. And why? Mm. And why, right? And maybe after experiencing the design bit build, because that's the traditional method, mm -hmm. then they'll find out that, okay, there's other better ways to do things, other better ways to deliver projects. Right. It might, it might have been informative to know uh, how, the, how the responses, if, if there were a way to do it, how the responses correlated to where people were. You know, in other words, if if a, if a person is in a mid-sized design-focused practice, and they and they and they their experience and preference is that design is delivered in a traditional way, which it's at least perceptibly by some practitioners, the designer has greater control. Then that might inform how you know the the methodology they prefer to use, and of course, owners, it's a it's a whole different response. And design, if I may add one more, design bit build as a traditional method of delivery is oftentimes still used today as the baseline to compare with other methods, mm -hmm. uh, including the risk uh, transfer, risk management, always uh, design bit build is still there to use as a starting point to compare with as you continue to uh, focus on continuous improvement. And so that's pretty much still the, the baseline. Maybe as the industry continues to shift over the other methodology, design build is actually leading compared to others, then time will tell us and that will be a change. Well, Go on. I was gonna say from a performance perspective, uh, when the, we do the research and look at the research, design build outperforms CM at risk or design bid build in both uh, uh, time, schedule, uh, cost, and uh, equal or better in quality. Uh, when I look at the different project delivery methods and selfishly want to choose one, I choose design build and I choose progressive design build as the, uh, the delivery method of choice. And somebody would ask me why, and I say because it's more fun working as a team and working together than a an adversarial structure where I'm tete -tete -tete with my uh, colleagues. So um, that's my choice because it's it's more rewarding professionally and I get the opportunity to excel at both design and construction. Yeah, that's yeah, and it, uh, yeah go on. I'm sorry. So, yeah, at UC San Diego, I mean, we have, we, we focus primarily on uh, CM at risk and design build. It depends on the project type. So a lot of our housing projects are delivered design build and most other projects are delivered with the CM at risk. But I think the experience people have with the different delivery methods depends upon a, a lot on how they're applied by the owner because they can have their pros and cons depending upon how they're managed. Well, that's, that's true. I mean, you can't necessarily mandate it. And a, a, a particular owner, I, any of you might weigh in on this, but a particular owner might have authority to use a, a, a method and, and, the, and the staff isn't comfortable or the decision makers aren't comfortable. And being able to um, get experts like we have here and experienced practitioners to explain the pro, the opportunities and constraints of each method comparatively 
uh, you know, Monty can talk to you about what the Judicial Council did, where we delivered the large program for the two decade, first two decades, primarily using CM at risk, and it was audited twice, and the results were pretty good. Uh, but there were there was a case made, and a very good case of shifting to design build based on industry data and experience with a few of the design build projects, which actually came in slightly comparatively better, as Dreg says, in terms of cost and time, although the projects were very varied sizes with varied circumstances. So I think we have very, actually have better representation here in our attendees than I expected in terms of people who work as clients representatives, which we do, we do have more members and members of the board who work as client and on the client side, as well as, um, as, as CMs. So I think the poll is informative and however we share that data when we um, uh, post up the recording, I think it'll be helpful. We have another question about delivery methods from Deborah Stevens and she's asking about lease leaseback. I, Monty had that in his slide, I'm not sure if that, was in particular to a, a public delivery method or a private delivery method, but I'll ask, I was gonna pose, for example, to Laura, just in the spirit of that question, and the federal government, it, we, we, this was asked to a, a panel of uh, a military, for military projects, do what uh, methods do they use? And of course, they're still doing largely traditional design bid build, but they are shifting a little. So Laura, could you tell us a little about where the federal government is going, not just the GSA, but uh, with your, your colleagues across the military organizations and the other, um, the Coast Guard and other um, segments that deliver the kind of work we do? Uh, well, it varies by agency. Um, DOD does have authorities uh, around lease leaseback for housing. GSA does not have that authority. Con Congress hasn't given it to us and OMB will not let GSA exercise it. But, you know, we've, we've tried to make the case several times that it's that and P3s might be um, useful tools and they disagree. So ongoing conversation. So it kind of depends on the agency you're working with. It kind of depends on the kind of project. The Federal Highways Administration has different authorities, um, and they do, and they they are able to, you know, they do public private park partnerships. Tolling is a is a lease lease back or a public private par public private partnership arrangement normally. Um, so that the I think it it that's that's about what I can give you on that. I mean, it just kind of depends on who you're working with. Thank you. Uh, uh, Kyle made a, um, a couple of comments in our in our chat here. Uh, certainly, Kyle, you make the point. It isn't a DB panel, but we we come with the breadth of experience with with design build and our. I would say we probably are all unapologetic advocates for whatever is the greatest breadth of project delivery in which. Um, uh, our, our clients or we have the authority and then the knowledge to execute. And that is one of the points of the, you know, calling it diverse ways to deliver work because it informs how design is delivered, how people prepare and learn about how to do work well and every aspect of our, of, of our, our practice together. Uh, lease, lease back. Uh, does someone want to just uh, in a brief, briefly explain what a lease lease back is, uh, strictly speaking, in terms of the type of contract it might be? Because, for example, in some public private, public private, we did one at in the judicial branch in California. It had its own authority. It wasn't in, in it wasn't entitled in the in the in the um, uh, public contract code, which we didn't use, and it was a lease back, and, but it was really it was really a, a public-private project that was called um, performance-based infrastructure. So, can we just d define for our attendees what lease leaseback actually is in a traditional contract? I don't think I've worked on a strict strict lease leaseback. 
Ani? Yes. You want me to do that? Would you? Well, um, with difficulty because my experience in least least back is limited to uh, K-12 schools in California. And uh, my opinion, this is just my opinion, is that uh, the lease lease back, it is called lease lease back delivery method. And that's what to do. There is a lease and then there is a, you know, it is leased back and uh, all the legally, legally they do the right things. And, but my opinion is that that particular process is nothing but CM at risk the way it is carried out in K-12 California and the uh, industry and the people, uh, lots of lawyers have, uh, found a loophole to get away from the public contracts code to use a different uh, law to use lease lease back process, but it has been legally challenged and uh, uh, it found the approval of the courts that it is okay to do that process. So, the, so, so that's based on that limited experience, I really, I don't think that I'm the expert to talk about, uh, you know, so I, what a true lease lease back will look like and how effective it would be. Yes, th thanks. Thanks for that. Uh, we have one hand up. So do we want that um, that person to just tell us what their question is and and then we'll we'll wrap up. Becca, I think you're going to unmute whomever it is. I gave Michael permission, but it looks like he might have actually typed it in the Q&A. So maybe we could just read it from there. Uh, what, let's see. Okay. Let's see. Can you read it for me? Yeah. Sure. So Michael oh, has a question that says- oh, my, Michael, what, Michael Falonis. Welcome, Michael. I've had a great experience with design build and one case where the builder took over the design side and made a number of compromising design decisions. Is this a trick question, Michael, which was very frustrating to us. I don't know what a takeover is. Any suggestion about how we as architects cannot try to prevent this from happening? Can try to I think you're asking how we can try to prevent this from happening. I, I guess what confuses me about the question is how a builder could take over the design side in a design build when the nature of a design build contract is that the, 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 the principal designer of record, whether it's a traditional DB or it's a progressive DB, the, the principal design architects and engineers are under the builder. That's the nature of it. So since Kyle, Kyle do you want to take this one and, and Greg can wrap it up because we, Michael's one of our, our colleagues and very engaged and um, knowledgeable, but uh, it, it, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a bit of a, of a trick question. Yeah, I think there's, there's different ways to approach it and to have controls in place. But yeah, I mean, sometimes uh, maybe if the design builder, the uh, contractor doesn't really truly uh, embrace the collaborative measures, they can cut corners. Uh, and uh, compromise design intent um, just for the sake of cost or schedule and maybe not looking at the holistic picture. Uh, but there's the ways to, to implement controls on this is really looking at back at the uh, owner's uh, programmatic requirements, uh, like the OPR or the basis of design and ensuring that you're delivering design excellence and delivering it uh, upon the original design intent that really it's a liability for the design builder to cut those corners. So it's really just reinforcing uh, a, a good uh, QC process uh, as far as the design implementation excellence, how it gets related to the field. I, I, I agree completely. And I, and I would say you could, you could take that comment to any delivery method. If the, if, the, if the basis of the design or the scope of work, which is the owner primary responsibility, whether it's federal or it's a private, or it happens at a local agency or a small client level, they, the problem needs to be properly uh, um, scoped, and then the contracts need to represent the, the fundamentals of, that, of those goals, and that can be successful or unsuccessful in any delivery method, in my experience, 
if the planning is done properly and the right contracts are written and they're at, then executed fully. Would, would, you, would you agree, Greg? Yeah, and I think um, when I, and I hear this, this complaint um, more often than not across industry, uh, where the design builder sort of steps between the designers and the and the owners, and I've got uh, two comments to that. Uh, one is uh, choose your partners wisely. Make sure that you have a partner that is educated in design build best practices and understands the roles of the people and what's the value that they bring. Now, with that said, um, you also need to understand the project risks. You know, the designers have risks, the builder has risks. And if you don't understand the builder's risks and you go off and do the design, you might find the builder stepping in because they've got to manage and mitigate the risks. And so you want to make sure you have the, choose your partners wisely, understand where the risks are as a team and look to mitigate those risks, risks collaboratively. And that's how you get the best performance for the owner. And I'm sure... Uh, Laura and the rest of the game will ha have something to say about this too. If I may jump in, um, and my point of view is coming from an owner advisor. And maybe my advice to you is just directly say, hire an owner advisor. Because me as an owner advisor can help the owner protect their decision rights. And so that is built into the development agreement, the agreement that's formed between the owner or the and the, de and the design builder and so that agreement has a systems in place as to how things are going to be processed. For example, from the start, uh, from the schematic design, design development, all those processes has built in a step that involves the owner to be a part of that decision making. So without the approval, it's not going to move forward. And therefore, the design builder is at risk of meeting the schedule or delaying the project otherwise. And therefore, if everybody's on the same page, that this is this process and mutually agreed upon, then everybody, the whole team knows the process on how to deliver it with respect to everybody's role without stepping on the designer as far as the design builder goes. I, I, think, I think there's truth to, to that. Uh, Laura? I was going to quickly add, um, yes, I totally agree with Greg, pick a partner. The owner has to be aware of that agreement. There's a they, There should be a teaming agreement. There are model documents at DBIA and at AIA for teaming agreements. And the owner should, should spend some time asking about what that teaming agreement includes and making sure that the team is living up to that agreement. That's a little bit of a new place for owners to be, but I think it's, it is one that would be very productive. I agree, and we could, we could talk about that for quite some time, but we're just about on the hour. Someone is asking about resources. Um, uh, Kyle mentioned a book that he had worked with, um, all of our expert, subject matter expert panelists, and. Um, accomplished colleagues here. Thank you again. And they've shared how they got to their paths and there are resources. We have a few resources here. We'll add any volumes that have been cited as Stephanie was asking about. I don't, won't have time to answer what, whether there are greater opportunities for more diverse applicants in certain sectors, but I would say now is your time. I think that it, what I see is that every employer is looking for the greatest talent and diversity across all the different job levels and, and, and be bold, just go for it. Try for, uh, look at opm.gov, look at the general contractors web pages, look at your local government sites, contact expert consultants like Monty's firm and feel free to reach out to any of us and for additional resources and we'll compile a few more and we'll post them up. And um, I, I'd like to thank you all. It's, I, I feel very honored to be part of this with all of you as your colleague and a long-term partner. And um, we, we, I think we all love what, what we do and wanna bring that to our, the breadth of our profession across genders, backgrounds, abilities, generations, career paths, educational choices, and so on. And so don't hesitate to let us know if we can help you and um, advance you as the future leaders of, of our broad 
broad and integrated AEC professions. And thank you all. Thank you. And thank, you, thank you from our board.